Just want to let you know we have just a few hours left in Unit 2, which means we're probably looking at Unit 2 test. Most likely next Friday. So what is that, March 2nd, I believe? So just be aware that that is coming up one week from today. So last time we finished up, we were talking about scientific notation and operations with scientific notation. And that can be a little tricky. Do anybody have any questions off the homework or any of the problems we did in class last, last class? Okay. So then today we're going to start talking about measurement. And measurement is kind of something that has evolved um, through time. And let's talk about the evolution of measurement here first. Measurement really evolved, developed at, out of a need to communicate. Um, Let's just take a crude example. Let's say that two of us are building something and we want to make sure we, we build, we're each building the thing and we want to make sure that they're both the, exactly the same. Well, if we're in the same room with each other, that's pretty easy to do. We can just walk over and say, oh, yours is that size and I can mark it off on mine and I can go make mine the same size. But if you are somewhere else, maybe across town or, or, or wherever, I can't just do that. I have to have some way to communicate that with you. I mean, I suppose it's possible that I could, you know, if that's my piece, I could take a piece of string or rope or a stick or something and make it that long and cut it or draw, make a mark on it or whatever, whatever and send it to you. That's pretty clumsy. And it would be really nice if I could just, to do not just one dimension like that, but if I could do other dimensions and if there are other features of that, maybe there's a small knob sticking out or whatever, that I could label several dimensions at once and not have to have all those little pieces that I, that I send to you. So they came up with some way for communicating and describing that to other people. So what they would do is they would take, for example, a pen. So this is a pen, and if I want to communicate, let's say that I'm cutting a piece the size of my piece of paper here, and I want to communicate that to you. I might say that's one, two, it's about two and a quarter pens long. So I, I send that message to you, and it comes to you, and you take your pen and you're measuring. Okay, so there's one, there's two. Well, notice with this pen, this is less than two pens long. So if you go two and a quarter pens, you're about out to here. That's way longer than the one I had, than the piece I had. So the flaw there, of course, was that the, the, your pen was a different size than mine. So there were two assumptions that were being made there. The first assumption was you have that item. You have a pen. And the second assumption is that they're the same size. So since so many objects had so many different sizes, they picked something that was relatively the same size and that pretty much everybody had. And that started out for lengths, at least. That was parts of the body. So if we're talking about standard units of length, and it's the standard units of length is the evolved system. Now by evolved system... I mean, it filled a need and then it was changed and refined and whatever over time to make it fit the needs as needs changed. So in our standard units of length, they chose to use body parts. In that standard unit of length, the smallest length that we usually use is the inch. So I would probably measure this piece of paper in inches. One inch was originally defined to be the distance from the end of your thumb to the point of that first buckle. So if I were to measure this piece of paper, 
I would go one, two, three, four, five, and I would count up to get the number of inches. Now, pretty much everybody had at least one thumb, and they were pretty close to the same size. I mean, there was a little bit of variation from one person to the next, but not a lot. Um, a couple things to note here. One is, you know, this was thousands of years ago, and people were smaller. So, you know, the average height was like around 5'3", five, 5'2", five, of, of a male. So, you know, there wasn't as much height, so there wasn't near as much variation in size of, of body parts for measurement. So that was, a, you know, a big restricting factor for consistency here. Now, as it got larger, um, the next largest unit that we typically use for lengths is, can anybody tell me? The foot. There we go. And a foot is 12 inches. Now, the foot is exactly what it sounds like. It is the distance from the back of your heel to the tip of your longest toe. Um, that would be a foot. Now, that foot then was used for measuring things that would take too long to count out inches for. Now, things that we would typically use a foot to measure weren't necessarily used back then. For example, if I wanted to measure the height of this wall next to me, I would use a foot. I would use feet. Well, back then, that wouldn't be possible because I could get up to about here, maybe with some serious stretching, but there's no way I'm getting my foot all the way to the ceiling to measure that wall, not unless I chop it off at the ankle. So a foot was really only good for measuring things that were along the ground or close to the ground because that's kind of where feet are located. So there were units that were used in here for measuring things that went vertical. They're not used anymore because our, our system has developed. But the hand, for example, the hand was approximately four inches. And it was used for measuring vertical things. It was bigger than an inch, so it was a lot quicker. And of course, it was easier to just stack your hands. So you could measure something like this wall, this vertical wall, very quickly by just stacking your hands up that wall. And if any of you are into horses or livestock, um, cattle, sheep, horses, most livestock, their height is still measured in hands. Um, now that's not needed anymore. Um, somewhere around the 500s, King Edward uh, declared that his thumb and his hand and his foot were going to be the official measurements of every place that he ruled. So the craftsmen came in and they took his thumb and they marked it off on a block of wood or, or whatever material they were using and they cut a bunch of those little inches the size of King Edward's thumb, and they passed them out for everybody to use. They did the same with his foot and his hand and other units of measurement. And by having those blocks now that people used, you didn't have to be able to eat your thumb or your foot into, this, into a place to measurement. You could actually use that block of wood to measure the height of the wall. So now we could measure the height of this wall in feet and it would be just fine. So we didn't need some of those other units anymore. The hand kind of disappeared as a need for a measuring unit. Now, King Edward's foot did not contain 12 of his thumbs. I mean, it was close to it, but not exact. It wasn't until a couple hundred of years later that people looked at this and thought it would be nice if we could convert between them. Originally, there was no conversion between inches and feet. If you measured something in feet and I measured something else in inches, there was no way that we could tell which one was longer. There was no conversion between them. So it was a couple hundred years after King Edward that they decided, you know, it would be really nice if we could compare them, if we could convert from one unit to another. So they adjusted the length of an inch and a foot to make it so there were 12 inches in a foot. And they did the same with all of our other units so that we could convert from one unit to another. Up until that point, if I measured it in inches and you measured something in feet, if we wanted to compare, one of us has to go back and remeasure using the other unit. Now, bigger than feet, there are other units that are kind of extinct, one of which is the cubit. 
one cubit was approximately 16 inches. What the cubit was, was the length from the tip of your longest finger to the point of your elbow. This was a carpenter's unit. In construction, almost everything seems to be spaced at 16 inches. The distance between wall studs, if you're framing a wall, um, the distance between floor joists as you're framing a floor, those are all about 16 inches. Those were spaced in cubits. You didn't have to lift up your foot and do you know, one and a half or one and a third feet. You just set your elbow on one and put the other end at the tip of your fingers and that was your distance. Now, obviously, there's a little bit more variation in the length of people's arms, so construction wasn't quite as standard back in those days. Now, the cubit has kind of disappeared as a unit, but we have gone up to bigger than a foot. We have the yard, and a yard is three feet. Now, again, this unit was adjusted to make that conversion fit. Um, a lot of people think of the yard as the length of a person's stride when they take a, a maybe somewhat larger than normal step. Um, and it is about that long, but that's not where it came from. The yard was actually a tailor's unit. If you take your arm and stretch it out, it is the distance from your outstretched arm to either the center of your chest or the point of your nose, depending on what region you're in. It is basically the same thing. And that was one yard. So if, some of you may still see that if you go buy fabric. They'll grab the fabric and they go one, two, and they're counting out yards. Bigger than a yard. Other units that have kind of disappeared. A fathom, um, which is actually about six feet, was actually a, a sailor's unit, navigational unit. Um, the fathom originally was about the shallowest water that most of your major ships could could navigate through without getting hung up on the bottom. Um, it literally was the height of one of the tallest sailors on the boat. They would actually just take a sailor, throw them overboard, and if they touched the bottom and their head still stuck up out of the water, they didn't navigate through there. Um, hopefully they pulled them back in, but who knows? It was different times back then. One that's larger than a yard that we are still going to, that's not quite as common, but we are still going to talk about, is a rod. A rod is 16 and a half, or 16.5 feet, or 5.5 yards. The rod actually came from a shepherd's tool. Um, most shepherds had two tools, the rod and the staff. Um, the staff was that little hook, kind of like you see little Bo Peep has the little white hook. Um, that was for catching the animals, you know, hook them around the neck so you could shear the wool or whatever. Um, the rod was a defensive weapon. It was literally for fighting off wild animals. They would take a sapling tree, cut it down and debranch it, and they would use that to, to chase away wolves or whatever else might be threatening the flock. Um, 16 and a half feet, that's pretty long, but you know, think about it, if you're chasing away wild animals, you do want that little bit of separation. Well, how it became used for measurement, well, let's say that I have some sheep and you have some sheep, and they go down into a valley to, to graze, and at the end of the day, you want your, you go to get your sheep back and I go get my sheep back, yeah, pretend those actually look like sheep. And well, I say that I have 17 sheep, and you say, well, you have 14 sheep, and there's only 25 sheep in the valley. But well, one or both of us is lying about how many sheep we had. A lot of fights broke out. Now, with cattle, that was settled by branding. Um, just put your burnt your mark onto them, and you could look very quickly and see which one was which. On sheep, that didn't work so well for a couple of reasons. Um, one, their wool grew out too thick, you couldn't see the brand. And two, and I don't know why this amuses me so much, but wool is pretty flammable. Um, yeah, I know, but the images flow for that one. But anyway, so what they did was rather than putting the sheep, letting the sheep go off together, they divided them up. This was the first um, land ownership, land division. 
we would say, okay, we're going to put my sheep over here and your sheep over there. And to settle any arguments about whether we have the same amount of, of pasture land, we would pay, take a big landmark, like a large rock, and I would take my rod and lay it down. And then you'd take yours and put it on the end, and we'd count one, two, and then I'd pick mine up and flop it over, three. And we'd say, okay, we've got 60 rods in this direction and 200 rods in that direction. That is the size of, of the pasture we're going to keep. That was land measurement. To this day, if you look at an official survey for a piece of land, it will be measured in rods. Actually, something called rods and chains. Surveyors' chains were also in there. Um, we're not going to talk about those units, but those are somewhere around the 40 yards, 44 yards, if I remember correctly, on a surveyor's chain. So bigger than rods, there were other units like furlongs. Um, a furlong was actually about the distance that a standard horse could run at full speed. It's approximately one eighth of a mile. Now again, the ones that I have over here in the light brown are ones that are extinct that you're not, not gonna need to do those conversions. I'm kind of throwing those out there for a little bit of history. Um, from the rod, the next unit that we really care about, we're gonna jump up to is the mile. One mile is of course, 5,280 feet or 1,760 yards or I believe it's 320 um, rods, but we're not going to get down into that for the miles. The origin of the mile, there are actually a couple of different stories about the origin of mile. Um, one of them was the distance King Edward could see from his throne out the window of the castle. Um, but there are others that are way more believable. Um, the one that I that, that seems to have the most uh, credibility for me is comes from the Greek and Roman military. And it was the distance that they could march in formation in a thousand paces. Um, for them, a pace was starting on the left foot, stepping to the right, and then back to the left. So 1,000 paces was about 5,280 feet. Um, the Greek prefix mil is 1,000. Um, if you look at the mill rate on, your on land taxes, if you looked at your parents' taxes or someday when you own land, the mill is the price per $1,000 of value. So a mill rate of 22 means for every $1,000 of value on the land, you pay $22 in taxes. That's where those standard units came from. Let's look at conversions. Now, many of us have worked with these standard units a length enough that we can convert, convert them fairly easily. And um, we already know how to convert them, so we don't really need to go through a process or, or really think too hard about it. But sometimes we run into units that we're not so familiar with. For example, let's say we started out with seven feet, and I asked you to convert that into inches. Most of us know you could just do seven times 12 from feet to inches is times 12 and get 84 inches. But if we didn't know that, there's a process we could go through. We could take the seven feet and put it over one, and we could multiply that by a conversion factor. Now, this conversion factor that I'm going to put in here is what we referred to when we were doing fractions as a unity fraction. Remember, a unity fraction was equal to 1. We were multiplying by 6 on the top and bottom. 6 over 6 equals 1. Well, this unity fraction still equals 1, but it looks a little bit different. We're getting rid of feet, so we're going to put feet on bottom. And we're converting 2 inches, so we're going to put inches on top. And then we fill in the relationship. One foot equals 12 inches. Now that doesn't look like it's one, it equals one, but it does because the numerator and denominator have the same value. They're just in different units. 12 inches is equivalent to one foot. So this is equal to one here. And we're multiplying by one means we might change the appearance, but we will not change the value. 
So now, using our rules of fractions, the feet will cross cancel. So they cancel out. We've got 7 times 12 inches is 84 inches. 1 times 1 is 1. So 84 inches over 1. Um, if there was anything on the denominator, we would divide that out. There isn't. So that's just 84 inches. So that's what we have here. This process is called dimensional analysis. And you can see, I didn't have to know anything about whether I needed to multiply or divide. All I needed to know was that equivalency, 12 inches equals one foot. And by placing the, the dimensions into the, the fractions accordingly, so that the dimensions canceled out where I needed them to, that told me what I had to do. The rest of the process is the same. I didn't have to figure out, do I multiply by 12 or do I divide by 12? When we get into our dosage calculations in the next unit, that's going to be an absolutely huge process for us. Let's take a look at a, a unit that we might not be as familiar with. Let's say we're going to take 99 feet, and I want to convert it into rods. Well, we haven't done enough work with feet and rods to know how to convert it just off the top of our head. So let's use that dimensional analysis. So we're going to take 99 feet, and we're just going to make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Now, in our conversion factor here, in our unity fraction, we have to ask ourselves, what are we getting rid of? We're getting rid of feet. So that means I'm going to put feet here on bottom so that it will cross-cancel out. And we're converting two rods, so rods are going to go on top. Now we need the relationship. One rod equals 16 and a half or 16.5 feet. So now the units of feet cancel out, and we can go ahead and do the math. 99 times one rod is 99 rods. On bottom, one times 16.5 is just 16.5. And we have to now divide this out. 99 rods divided by 16.5 is six rods. Like I said, that process is going to be absolutely vital for us when we do our dosage calculations. It also allows us to convert from units that we don't typically have a, a conversion factor for. For example, we might have two rods, and I want to convert it into inches. Well, we don't have a direct conversion from rods into inches, but it doesn't matter. We'll take our two rods and put them over one. In our conversion factor here, we're getting rid of rods, so I'm going to put rods on bottom. Now, normally I'd put inches on top because we're going to inches, but we don't have that direct relationship. So rather than going from rods to inches, I have to go to something that I know the relationship to rods for. That would be feet in this case. We know one rod is 16.5 feet. So now the rods would cancel out and we have feet as our only unit. But we don't want feet, we want inches. So we keep going with another conversion factor. In this next conversion factor, we want to get rid of the feet. So we're going to put those so that they'll cross cancel out. And now feet do go directly into inches. One foot is 12 inches. So now the, the units of feet cancel out and we are left with only inches as our units. So now this is going to get us where we want to go. Now it's just a matter of doing the fraction operations. 2 times 16.5 is 33. 33 times 12 is 300 and, oops, 396. That is inches. On bottom is just 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1. So that's 396 inches. I'm just going to double check my math. It's been one of those mornings. It is 396. So two rods is 396 inches. Now, of course, there are other units other than lengths that we want to do. Let's look at weight. Now, weight, before we can really talk about weight, we need to talk about the difference between weight and mass. Um, in a lot of cases, we get sloppy. 
And we treat the two things as though they're the same, and they're not. Weight is defined to be the force of gravity pulling on an object. Mass is defined to be the amount of matter. In an object. Now, matter is just the, the particles, the amount of particles, the amount of, of stuff, basically, in that object. Now, you might think, well, aren't they, they the same? Well, they're very closely related. There's a truth to that. But the biggest difference is how they're measured. Weight is measured using a resistance, a spring. A spring, a good spring, I should say, is one such that if this is my spring with no force on it, so that's its length, if I add a force to it, it'll stretch this distance here. Oops, I marked that correctly. So it stretched from here to here. That's with that amount of force. If I double that amount of force, it doubles the length that the spring stretches. So the amount of stretch in the spring is directly proportional to the amount of force that's put on it. So weight is measured with something called a spring scale. So we might have a spring. And that spring will be located on a scale. The scale is just a evenly spaced system of numbers. The bottom of that spring has an indicator put to it. When there's no force on it, that is the zero point. And as we put something on the bottom of this, it's going to stretch it out. Where that indicator moves to, that is the weight of that object. So it is measuring how much gravity pulls down on that spring because that object hanging on there. Mass is measured with a balance. Kind of like a teeter-totter. You put the object that we are trying to measure on one end of it, and on the other end, we put known masses. And once it balances, whatever this known mass is, is the mass of that object. Now you might be looking at it and say, well, that still uses gravity. But it uses gravity in a much different way. For example, if you go to the moon, the moon has approximately one-sixth of the gravity of Earth. So over here on my spring scale, that's going to have one-sixth of the force. That's going to stretch one-sixth the amount. That's going to be my new weight. But my balance, yes, the gravity is going to pull less on the object, but it's also going to pull less on our known mass. The mass does not change. So mass is constant. Regardless of gravity, weight depends on gravity. Now, we're on Earth, where gravity is relatively constant. Um, there are slight variations. The lowest gravity is actually at the North and South Poles. The, or sorry, the highest gravity, I should say, is actually at the North and South Poles. That's the most gravity. The least gravity is at the equator. It is less than a 10% difference, but that is somewhat significant if you're doing precision measurement. Um, someone who, met, who weighs 200 pounds at the North Pole might only weigh about 180, well, let's just say 180 at the equator. Because, so there is 
variation in the amount of gravity on the Earth. But plus or minus, or it's actually plus or minus 5%. It's within 10% total tolerance. So we consider gravity to be constant on the Earth. So since we are assuming a constant gravity, we can kind of move interchangeably between mass and weight. Now, in the standard measuring system, there is a unit of mass. You won't need to write this down. The standard mass unit is called the slug. One slug, by the way, is about 32 pounds. Many of you have probably never heard of a slug formally used for measurement. Um, you may have heard the, the slang phrase, there's a whole slug of them over there. That's where that comes from. They're referring to that unit of mass. In the standard system, we tend to use weight more. So let's talk about standard units of weight. We're going to start out on the large end. The largest unit of weight we tend to use is the ton. One ton is thought to be 2,000 pounds. Now that is actually something called one net or short ton. 99.99% of the time, maybe even more often, if you hear the word ton, that's what they're talking about, 2,000 pounds. But there is a difference if I, you know, but by saying that that's a net or a short ton, that is implying that there's something called a gross or long ton. And there is. A gross or a long ton is 2,240 pounds. Um, the difference here is basically the same as the difference between your gross paycheck and your net paycheck. You, know, you all know if you work 40 hours at... $10 an hour, multiplying these out, by the way, is an example of dimensional analysis, which I'll show you later. Um, 40 times 10 is $400. That's your gross pay. You know you don't actually get that much. They're going to take out taxes and, and other things. And you might get a paycheck of about, oh, $290 or whatever. That is your net pay. The same thing was originally used for measuring grain. Well, you can't put a ton of grain on a scale. It kind of falls off. So you had to put it in a container. So the container that held a ton of grain was about 240 pounds. So the gross ton was the grain and the container. The net ton, the 2,000 pounds, was just the amount of grain if you subtracted out the container. So continuing, we obviously have the pound. Now the abbreviation for pound is LB. Um, it would have made a lot of sense to use PD for pound. However, in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. We didn't want to mix those up. So they went to the Latin word for pound, which was Libra and came up with the abbreviation LB. Now smaller than a pound, we have ounces. There are 16 ounces in a pound. The abbreviation for ounces also comes from the Latin word for ounce. It's OZ. I don't remember what that word is right now. Um, easy enough to look up. But 16 ounces, oops, sorry. OZ was the abbreviation for ounces. Smaller than an ounce, um, a lot of people are not familiar with this unit, but in the medical field, it's very important. It was a dram. One ounce contains 16 drams. Now, a dram sounds metric, but it's different. A gram is metric with a G. A dram with a D is a standard unit. And a dram was one of the original apothecary units. Apothecary means for medications. You might be prescribed an eighth of a dram of something. Um, other units that you probably have heard before 
One is a grain. Now, a grain did not go off of ounces. For some reason, for grains, it went all the way back up to pounds. One pound contained 7,000 grains. Um, the actual grain was a grain of sand that they used, um, literally counting them out with the tweezers. To get, there were 7,000 of them in a pound on average. Um, there were minims. There were 60 minims. In and outs. Now, minims have been absorbed into the standard system. Um, grains have actually been absorbed into the standard system, or sorry, not standard, the metric system. So we're going to talk about grains in the metric system as we as we get into those units. Now, you hear a lot on the news about gold, silver, and other precious metals. This part that I'm about to say you'll never be tested on, but I'm just throwing it out there for your information. When you hear that gold has hit $1,700 an ounce or whatever it's at, uh, they're not talking about these ounces and these pounds here. You know, I mentioned that King Edward had declared his thumb and his foot to be the official measurements of the land. He wasn't the only king that did that. Different regions had different kings and, and different ones they made that same declaration. So the problem, one of the problems with the standard system was from one country to the next, they might not be standard. The units, an inch might not be the same. And that happened with all of our units, including our units for weight. So for buying and selling precious metals, the center of trade in the world at that time was in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea on the Isle of Troy. So to this day, they tend to use Troy measurement for buying and selling gold, silver, and other precious metals. In the Troy measuring system, one Troy pound is approximately, not exactly, about 0.82 of our regular pounds. However, one Troy pound only contains... 12 troy ounces. So even though a troy pound is smaller than a standard pound, a troy ounce is actually a little bit larger than our standard ounce. Now again, I'm never going to test you on those numbers, but just be aware when they're talking about the price of gold and silver, it's not a regular ounce that they're talking about. They're talking about special measurement for precious metals. Our next unit that we want to talk about today is Capacity. Now, once again, just like with the weight and mass, I have to make a distinction between capacity and volume. This distinction is not quite as clear cut as the distinction between weight and mass. Volume is measured by multiplying links. For example, um, most easiest to apply it to a box. If I have a box that is 12 inches by 8 inches by 10 inches, the volume of that box is 12 inches times 8 inches times 10 inches, which is going to come out to 960 cubic inches. So volumes are measured in a length unit cubed. So it's a length unit that's gone in three perpendicular directions. A length, a width, and a height. Capacity is actually standard size containers. So let's go through some of our units of capacity here in our last few minutes. We're going to start out with the gallon. Now, a gallon was actually the size that of a standard man's hat. Now, I'm not talking about a cowboy hat. I'm talking about you know more of the European-style dress hat they had. Um, most of those held about a gallon. 
you know, the average men's hat would be about a gallon. Um, you hear, you know, the cowboy hats, um, you hear the term 10 gallon hat, which is what a cowboy hat is usually referred to. That was just a sarcastic phrase of, oh boy, there's a 10 gallon hat. That just meant it was a really big hat compared to normal. Smaller than a gallon, we had a quart. A gallon contained four quarts. The word quart actually comes from shortening the phrase quarter gallon. So a quart means quarter, it is a fourth of a gallon. One quart contains two pints. Now a pint was actually a standard size, technically it was a jar, but it was also used for a drinking glass. Um, it was a standard size container that was on its own. So the size of the gallon and the pint were adjusted later so that they would fit together. Smaller than a pint, we had the cup. The cup, and of course there's two cups in a pint, the, and these again were adjusted to fit together. The cup was actually literally as a, was actually a powder, a dry measurement. It was powder like flour or sugar. It was how much you could dump into your cup hand. And what would stay in there if you had it heaped up on there was a cup. So the cup was actually dry measure where a quart, a gallon, and a pint were liquid measure, but they were adjusted to fit together. Smaller than a cup, one cup contained eight fluid ounces. Smaller than fluid ounces. One fluid ounce contains two tablespoons. Now, I'm not going to go into a lecture on it, but be very careful with the abbreviations for tablespoons. And the next one here, um, one tablespoon contains three teaspoons. There's actually three or four acceptable abbreviations for each of those. So in many cases, you've got to be very careful to make sure you're getting the right one. These next few units, I'm not going to test you on, but... I'm going to throw them out there just for fun. Smaller than a teaspoon is a dash. One teaspoon contains two dashes. A dash was like a, a salt shaker, but there were spice shakers a lot larger than a salt shaker. It was only one, tip, one dash of a shaker. The amount that came out was a dash. One dash contained about three pinches. That's just what it sounds. You stuck your fingers in, pinched them together. And this, again, was a powdered measurement. What, whatever amount of that spice stayed between your fingers was a pinch. And one pinch contained two smidgens. This one always kind of grossed me out a bit. A smidgen was, if you stuck your finger into the spice or the flour or whatever, whatever stuck to your finger, you put into the recipe. That one, I don't know why it grossed me out. Is the thought of the cook with the sweaty hands has bigger smidgens, I guess, but. And of course, there are other units that we've that we're not going to be concerned about in medical fields. There's a bushel, which is actually eight gallons. There's a peck, which is two gallons. Now, if you ever go to like a strawberry patch or whatever, usually they have trays for sale. It's a one peck or a two peck tray of strawberries. There's a barrel. A barrel is thirty one point five gallons. And there are others. There's a hogshead, there's a drum, and other things. Okay, so we are out of time right now for those. We'll talk about the metric system on, um, on Monday. So for right now, page 103, 1 through 19, the odds, deal with our standard measurement system. I said we'll talk about metric uh, more on Monday. And we'll deal with some, some other units as, as far as those are concerned. And then we'll have Wednesday to finish up our measurements and conversions. And next Friday, as I said, will be our unit two test. Do you guys have any questions?